Okay, I think we'll start. Um, thank you all very much for coming. Um, this is a uh, talk as part of the Conspiracy and Democracy Research Project. Please switch off the phones. Switch off the phones. Please switch off the phones. Um, it's you, Rachel, on top of it. Um, which is, so the Conspiracy Democracy Project, for those of you who don't know, um, it's a Lieberhum uh, funded project for five years. It's led by Richard Evan, John Norton, from those of you who are Wilson will know as a president and vice president. And there's also David Runciman, who is um, the chair of Polis and a professor in political theory. Um, and we have a number of different, we've had a number of different events. We've been going for a, about a year and a half so, uh, or so now. We've had a number of different events, talks, seminars, et cetera. We had a, con a conspiracy film season uh, last term, which was very interesting and a bit fun. Um, and we have, so we have a term card, which I have here. There's some term cards there, and there's posters for the upcoming folks, which you're welcome to take. <coughs> and so I should say, actually, um, in, in this, no, I'm sorry, next Tuesday, in not this room, but the one underneath, David Runciman will be speaking to the Wolfson Humanities um, Society. So that's Tuesday, the 20th of May, in the Gatsby Room downstairs. Um, we'll be talking about climate change and conspiracy. Um, and we'll be back here on Wednesday, next Wednesday, same time, um, next week, where um, Joseph Parent and Joseph Uksinski um, from the University of Miami will be talking about um, American conspiracy theory. So you're very welcome to come back and do take um, a term card um, with you before you leave. But without any further ado, um, it's my great pleasure to um, introduce Pascal Girard, who's come from the University of Reims, um, who will be talking to us today. Um, his uh, the title of his talk is Conspiracy Theories in France and Italy during the Cold War and Decolonization, which has worked as come out of the, um, his PhD, which he recently completed at the European University Institute in Florence. Um, the format will be Pascal will speak for about 45 minutes, um, and then David Runciman will offer a brief comment for about 10 minutes or so, 5 to 10 minutes, <laughs> 5 to 10 minutes or so, and then we'll open to discussion um, um, for the next half an hour or so. After that, you're all warmly welcome to join us for drinks, which will be downstairs, if I'm not mistaken, in, in the entrance. So without any further ado, Pascal, over to you. And thank you for coming. Thank you very much. So um, the 13th of May is a very special day for who studies French conspiracies. That means, well, maybe three or four people, including me, of course. And uh, indeed, the 13th of May in 1958, exactly 56 years ago today, exactly, and the hour is also uh, more or less exact, a group of French Algerian nationalists carried out a rather simple plan actually in a hurry the evening before. They managed to turn a demonstration into a riot and assaulted the building of the governor of Algeria. You saw it there. And is, here is a crow. Yeah. They eventually seized and destroyed the building and destroyed a part of the documents within the building. The witnesses of the attack perfectly remembered that uh, the archive paper were thrown out of the windows and, uh, of the building. And as the building is up a hill, they just, well, fall down on the rest of the town of Alger. And uh, uh, the main, um, one of the main conspirators uh, well, just saw a typewriter fall in front of him and well, a second later it would have changed really the, the, really the events. This assault was the beginning of a series of unpredictable events that in less than three weeks resulted in the collapse of the Fourth Republic, the return of General de Gaulle and some months later the birth of the Fifth Republic. The current political regime of France is partly due so to an intense sequence of small conspiracies and the threat of a military coup, a situation that France had not undergone for more than one century at the time. This fact, which is everything but glorious of course, could partly explain why the celebration of the birth of the Fifth Republic in 2008 has been so discreet. Surprisingly, the issue of conspiracies threatening the state has been far more important in French political discourse before 1958, before this event, than after, and especially compared to nowadays politi politics. And that was the starting point of uh, my research, of my PhD. In this research, I also adopted a comparative perspective, studying both France and Italy, because of the similarities of the situation of these two countries. Two democracies, greatly weakened by the Second World War, because of course of the destruction, but also of uh, a kind of civil war to a certain extent. Two democracies with sent 
center on center right governments, but at the same time with the two most powerful communist parties of the Western Europe. And of course, it's obviously of great importance in the context of the Cold War. My past research dealt with a certain kind of, cons of conspiracy, uh, political conspiracies, I could give a definition later, but uh, as to the great despair of my supervisor, the PhD was uh, maybe the longest ever defended at the EUI. I have to skip really many aspects of it, so methodology, theoretical framework, definitions, and also the study of real conspiracies. Uh, which was a big, big part of it. So I will just today focus on the question of the belief in conspiracies and conspiracy theories. So first I will provide some historical background and describe the kind of belief of conspiracies I brought to light during my research. Then I will try to understand which factors played a role in the birth and spread of these, uh, these beliefs. Sorry. And finally I will try, if I've got some time, to link this research to nowadays conspiracy theories. And then I hope that you will have some questions, not because you didn't understand my English, but because you really understand what I wanted to say. So, first, of course, at the time, at the time of the Cold War, there is much evidence about the importance of the fear of a communist conspiracy in France and Italy. But I think it would be very adventurous and very exaggerated to claim that there was a Red Scare comparable to the one of the United States during the McCarthy area, at least for one reason. There is no material and no sources able to give us any debatable indications about it. Indeed, a methodological problem is how to assess the importance of the scare of a plot and the scare of the communist plot. The way that I found to overcome this fundamental difficulty was to try not to analyze the whole public opinion, not the whole society, but to work on well-defined groups, member of the government, member of the police, the army, the military, and also members of political parties. Because of the enormous amount of documents, the most significant uh, and time-consuming also study is one of the police. Indeed, the police archive, in particular in Italy, are full of reports of plans and preparation of a communist coup. The main part of these reports are based on rumors and fake documents provided by informers, informers which were actually very often anti-communist agitators and sometimes communist agitators. I will show you here two examples of this kind of documents. Oh, sorry. Okay. And first example, sorry. So the first document is a map of a supposed communist plan of uprising in Milan in 1952. Well, even if no one here had ever uh, been part of a city riot, you can understand that this map is, of course, absolutely useless. It's uh, very aesthetic, of course, uh, but, uh, well, of course, anything which is very important when you want to take control of the city is represented here. So, uh, of course, this document is uh, we compare it with a real map of Milan, of course, is uh, absolutely of a nonsense. So the only thing we could say about this map is that it's kind of mental projection of the kind of spider's web the communist activists were supposed to have woven around the city of Milan, according to the anti-communist agitators, but that's the only thing we can learn from it. And the documents, second one, is also from an Italian police report and it's supposed to be a card of a member of a paramilitary and clandestine organization, a communist organization, aiming at provoking an uprising in Milan also. Of course, such a card with, you see, the name, date of birth, the address, is absolutely absurd. You don't have such a card with you when you're part of a clandestine organization. So, I mean, <laughs> well, we shouldn't love because uh, apparently the Russian propaganda tried to use the same kind of manipulation some weeks ago, so, but uh, in Ukraine. But uh, still, of course, these two documents are obviously fake documents and as are everything but convincing about the existence of a communist conspiracy. What is really important is that they were considered credible enough for the Italian police so that they were the starting point of police investigations. And the second document, this one, was sent with a short report on the 1st of April 1948, and it was not because it was uh, April Fool's Day, it was really a serious document. And it was sent to the some members of the government, even the Home Office. 
that show that fact proves that within the Italian police, the belief of a communist conspiracy was strong enough to make some of the policemen, at least, take seriously what seemed to be obviously fake documents. Another illustration of the strength of this fear of, well, within the state administration and especially within the police, is the conspiracist interpretation of the riot of July 1948 in Italy. I don't know, I don't think that many people know about that. So I will just remind some, uh, something about this event. On the 14th of July 1948, a young student, an Italian student, tried to kill Palmiro Togliatti, who was the general secretary of the Italian Communist Party at the time with an old revolver, which is important because he didn't manage to kill him because of that. Togliatti was seriously injured, and in the following hours, in many points of Italy, communist, ri uh, communist riots erupted. During the three days rioting, well, well this three day rioting, sorry, caused something like 15 deaths and left at least 200 people injured. The interpretation of many of the prefects and even of the Home Office Minister was that even if nothing noticeable just occurred in their own region or province, was that this riot was the proof of an attempted rebellion, the proof of an attempted revolution. Nonetheless, despite this kind of clues about the police, which are rather numerous and conclusive, but only without the police, I would generally not call this fear of a, police, of a communist coup a conspiracy theory at least for the main part of the French and Italian population. Indeed, uh, what I call a conspiracy theory is a consistent and quite long-lasting belief in a conspiracy explaining some events on some important evolution. Actually, the intensity of this fear clearly greatly varied with two high moments of scare, the end of the year 1947 and the year 1948, and summer 1950. But apart from this moment of this crucial moment, Italian, especially France, can't be said to have been gripped by fear. From the end of the 40s to the end of the 50s, the analysis of the political propaganda, but also the debate at the head of the state or within the political parties, shows that the issue of a communist coup was everything but an obsession. Moreover, even during this short, per this short period of real fear of a communist rebellion, a communist revolution, it did not lead to the construction of a consistent public discourse about the communist threat. The words or expression explicitly evoking a communist conspiracy were rarely used in public di political discourse, and even rarely used during the debates between the party leader, which were not supposed to be known by any anybody. Here is one of the very rare French examples of the public use of the expression fifth column about the Communist Party have underlined it here. Of course, this is a terrific poster. It looks like, uh, I don't know, a poster for a slasher movie, but uh, it's really frightening. But it's a very rare example. Usually the poster were not that terrific. So I can find some example, but they are very, very occasional. In both country, and of course, this poster is from 1950. So I mean, the worst year concerning the, uh, the belief in the communist conspiracy. In both countries, after this dramatic summer 1950, in police reports, in political debate or propaganda, the issue of communist coup and of a communist subversion decreased. At the end of the 50s, both in France and Italy, communist parties remain, of course, politically marginalized. But the fear of a communist rebellion was really less important and not real, a real topic anymore. Of course, this very general statement has to be qualified. Actually, some political forces did build a real conspiracy theory, including the communist threat. But it actually concerned small and minority parties, such as the one of the French nationally far, far right. And they were not that numerous. Another exception, from what I found in the archive, is the French army. Oh, yeah, this is a bit difficult to, to see, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, the French army remained really longer focused on the communist danger. This map is from a big file uh, for, of the French army from 1953 concerning the French territory defense plan. It clearly shows that in case of a Soviet invasion, some member of the headquarters staff feared some attacks coming not only from well, the USSR and coming through Germany, but some attacks coming from within. That means some attacks coming from the communist members. 
And um, of course, the aim was to block the communication between North and Southern France. Well, we don't know why it would it could be useful in case of Soviet invasion, but that was in this uh, in this defense plan. And as a map, this one from the same file shows that this military estimated that the communists could have at their disposal an enormous strength of several hundreds of thousands of militia fighters. In Paris, for example, it's one hundred thousand militia fighter, militia, communist militia fighter, in case of uprising. The problem, of course, is that they did uh, knew, uh, they did know, sorry, how, uh, well, difficult it was to mobilize a communist member, so the communist, so uh, they just imagined that uh, in case of uprising, it was the foreigner or uh, the immigrant people from North Africa who, were, who would have been part of the rebellion. Evidence of this kind could be found in French military exercises until at least the end of the 50s. Last observation, the fear of communist conspiracy was earlier and higher in Italy, and the process of its decline sorry, was also slower than in France. It is evident in the police report, the amount of reports about a communist clandestine organization or possible rebellion remained quite significant during the 50s. But at the end, even in Italy, the evolution was quite similar. It is true among the leader of the main Italian party, the Christian Democrat Party, whose vision of communists move from violent conspirators to liars and demagogues, which is very negative, but still it's a bit better. And it's true also from what I can know within the Italian public opinion. Was it less obvious and less well known than the Red Scare is that the other great fear of uh, this period has been the fear of the renewal of the far right and its supposed attempts to seize power. In France, the plot discovered between 1945 and 1949 very early sustained the fright of a growing conspiracy of a far right trying to find a way to subvert the democratic regime. In this country, the question of far-right conspiracy was important enough in 1947 to call forth no less than two polls about the existence of a conspiracy. So the, first, the result of the first poll shows that more than one-third of the population clearly had the conviction that uh, believed that a plot was threatening the uh, French Republic. What is noticeable, of course, is that it's not surprising at all is that this belief was more widespread on the left wing than on the right wing. And it was shared by a majority of communist voters. Several months later, a second poll shows more clearly that the conviction of a right wing conspiracy threatening the regime was very dominant within the communist party here. Yeah why it was shared by minority in the other political movement. So you see the difference between communist and other political movement from the left to the right. During the following years, the question of a right-wing conspiracy returned time to time on the French political agenda, but this recurrent fear of a rightist conspiracy could not be considered, in my view, as a conspiracy theory in the main part of the population or in the main part of the political movement. Indeed, the fear varied with the discoveries of the various conspiracies and did not result in a consistent discourse about a permanent plot against the Republican institution. With one remarkable exception, of course, the Communist Party. To be fair, if the Communist Party consistently denounced the right-wing conspiracy, this conspiracy was supposed to be part of a wider conspiracy, a real grand conspiracy. Indeed, from the end of the Second World War to the beginning of the Cold War, the communist accusation of conspiracy concerned more and more groups, rapidly including all the French political movements, from the extreme right to the extreme left, as well as a certain number of foreign countries, primarily, of course, the United States. So I try with this design to give the impression of a never-ending cosmic expansion. Well, I don't know if it's really a success, but that's why I try to, to show is that at the end, of course, everybody was part of the conspiracy, United States, government, far right, far left, everybody. So it was just, uh, the, it's really, really the definition what, of what we could call a grand conspiracy in this case. 
Well, in Italy, the fear of a neo-fascist conspiracy, of a far-right conspiracy, was also quite widespread. But it was, well, it did not only concern uh, the Communist Party. The most part of the Italian political movements uh, were worried about uh, activities of the small group of neo-fascists uh, committing attacks and bombings. And the most repressive law, and I think it's noticeable, the most, most repressive laws voted by the Italian governments targeted more neo-fascists than communists at the time. So turning back to the Italian Communist Party itself, the situation is very comparable to the French one. From 1948 onwards, its propaganda denounced the governmental and American conspiracy as well, logically including in the hostile activity of the Catholic Church. So what I show here is one Italian communist poster, and it demonstrates a very conspiracist view of domestic political life. You see the main minister of, main minister of the Italian government, also the uh, president of the Republic, viewed as simple, uh, a simple sorry, puppet in the end of the evil American power, which, which is actually, who is actually, well, uh, Truman, Harry Truman, well, with uh, very devilish Harry Truman uh, in red also. The second poster is an Italian communist poster also. It's uh, supposed to be an electoral poster, which is a bit surprising because uh, you're, well, there's nothing about Italy in it. There's no national domestic concern. It's uh, all about foreign affairs. And you see, of course, the end of America, Wall Street. You see the flame, which is a dollar. And you see a lighter. So the lighter is a particular brand. It's not a Zippo, it's a Tito. So it's uh, uh, the leader of the communist Yugoslavia here, who broke up with the U USSR in spring 1948. So for a large part, uh, especially in France, uh, that is the importance of the denunciation of conspiracies in communist propaganda, which was very dominant at that time, and literally set the political agenda that could explain the prominence of the issue of conspiracy in politics. Such a discourse of grand conspiracy against a nation and its only defender, the Communist Party, seems nowadays maybe a bit too excessive and could really lead to the suspicion of manipulation, hypocrisy, and, well, instrumental use. Indeed, I found evidence that the fear of conspiracy has been used as a political tool by the Communist Party, so I won't go into details about that, but it was useful to mobilize uh, communist members inside, but also to bring some political adversaries into disrepute, and moreover, to facilitate an alliance with the left-wing forces. But there is more convincing evidence concerning the reality and sincerity of the belief in conspiracy within the Communist Party. For example, while the word conspiracy was quite rarely used by the leaders of the other political movements, the propaganda of the French and Italian Communist parties regularly and clearly use the word conspiracy for public propaganda, but also during internal debates. It even appeared to be a kind of real category of thought, and in 1952-53, a part of the debates of the French Communist Political Bureau was entitled The Struggle Against the Governmental Conspiracy, and this kind of topic included a significant part of the activity of the party itself. More anecdotal but significant, the French Communist Party bought in 1948 two armored cars for the two main leaders of the party, so Maurice Torres and Jacques Duclos. Well, actually, they uh, didn't really use them because they were very heavy, uh, they were very difficult to drive, so maybe Maurice Torres used it to bring his uh, children at school uh, every day, but that's, that's all, I mean, they didn't really use it. But the fact is that, what is really important is the fact that the communist leaders had maybe the most protected cars in France at the time. It was, they were better protected than the minister or the president of the republic. So it's very significant of uh, this kind of fear, of course, of conspiracy. And to be quite honest, there were good reason to fear a conspiracy against the Communist Party. This car has been bought in reaction to the attempted murder, I've talk, uh, spoke about it before, of the leader of the Italian par Brother Party, Togliari. To this respect, in Italy, the most important clue of the strength of the belief in a grand conspiracy against the Communist Party actually lies precisely in this riot of July 1948. The man who tried to kill Palmiro Togliati was actually a young student, 18 years old, named Antonio Palante, a single individual with, well, no clear link with any political party. 
but without knowing anything about the attempt killer. The interpretation of this event which immediately came to mind to many communists was that its attempt of murder was directed by the government. This common opinion was summed up by the slogan Anosperato a Togliati, which means they shot Togliati. They, of course, standing for the government. And in many points of Italy, riots broke out and communists spontaneously assaulted policemen or members of the right-wing or center-right wing movement. These violent riots are certainly the best proof that many communists truly believe that such an attempt murder could not be anything else than the result of a governmental conspiracy. This event reminds us, by the way, that even extremists have, could have good reason to believe in an hostile conspiracy. And that is the first point I will examine in my second part. How could we explain the importance of the fear of conspiracy at that time? So during my research, I tried to uh, build, to elaborate a kind of schema to point out the process at work in the emergence and spreading of conspiracy theories. But now with time, I think that, well, it looks like uh, a cocktail glass in which you put some ingredients and you have a conspiracy theory at the end. But uh, I try make, to make, well, something evident. So there are three main factors about it. So of course, the context, the events, political culture and ideology, and the role of propaganda. So I won't go into details about the role of propaganda because I think it's very easy to understand, and I will just analyze the two other factors. So the first one, the context, and the second one, ideology and culture. So an explanation, at least as evident as the role of propaganda in the birth of conspiracy theories is the importance of the context. And Staying the, stating sorry, the obvious, the kind of event that is more likely to provoke the fear of a conspiracy is, of course, conspiracy. So the point is that there have been some unveiled and some real conspiracy in France during the late 40s and during the late 50s. But none of them took place in Italy and none involved the communists. And even in France, the main part of these far-right conspiracies was actually derisory and really laughable. The only real political conspiracy during this period has begun, as I said before, on the 13th of May 1958, but these events rapidly led to the collapse of the Fourth Republic and the establishment of the new regime. So the narrative based on the conspiracy theory was built afterwards. Therefore, the rarity and the minor importance of conspiracies cannot be the major explication of the prominence, explanation, sorry, of the prominence of the fear of conspiracies at that time. So we could consider the role of a wider concept, context, of the geopolitical context. The strength of the fear of a communist insurrection is obviously connected to the Cold War and particularly varied with the fear of the Soviet invasion, which was, it was supposed to be coordinated. Oh. Here it is. Thanks to some polls which have been made in France and in Italy, we have a clear idea of the state of public opinion about the Cold War and the danger of a war. Considering France in this case, this graph shows that the fear of a war to come decreased in France from 1945 to uh, 1956, clearly, as well as did the scale of a communist surprising. We notice two peaks of fear of war. It is here, well, after the end of the war, during the Cold War, 1948 and 1950, which are precisely the two years with the highest fear of a communist coup. So apparently there is clear connection between the fear of a war and the fear of a communist coup. But in reality, this correlation between two evolutions does not tell us how the context shaped the beliefs of people. In fact, the part of the population, the most afraid of the Third World War, so the people who really believe here in the, in, well, the danger of a war, was actually the communists. In short, the most frightened by an upcoming conflict were also, for obvious reason, the less likely to fear a communist conspiracy because they were the communists. So in this case, the connection between the geopolitical context and the Red Scare appears to be a bit misleading, and the impact of Cold War should be understood maybe in the domestic context itself. Actually, I just well, skip some things about uh, about that, but I, I won't go into details that time. 
What made this the eventuality of a communist coup gaining in prominence were the spectacular waves of communist violence inside the country during autumn 1947 and 48 in France and in Italy. In the same perspective, but the other way around, the very brutal state repression of the communist demonstrations in Italy is also an explanation of uh, the belief of a governmental conspiracy against the Communist Party. So you can see it the other way around. But still, the link between the context of violence and the fear of a conspiracy has to be questioned. In Italy, the fear of a neo-fascist coup appeared to be more important while the neo-fascists were isolated and weak. And this fear lowered when the neo-fascist violence burns into a more spectacular way from 1950 onwards. All that means that the international and domestic context do not have a mechanical and intrinsically predictable impact on the fear of conspiracy. From what I found during my research, no one, or at least not many people, and especially no political movement seems to be immune to the fear of political conspiracy. And this is precisely why the context is so important and why it could play a role. But what is even more obvious is that the political affiliation had a real role and that the context alone cannot explain everything. For instance, the reading of the archives of the French center-right movement, the MRP, shows that conspiracy, even the real genuine ones, were never a specific issue within the party, while its member underwent exactly the same context than the far right. To this regard, the belief in conspiracy appeared to be more deeply and strongly rooted in the far right and the far left often to the point that this fear could be considered as a basis of a real conspiracy theory. The statement that conspiracy theory seems to be linked to extremist, to extremist movement or to extremism is absolutely not innovative at all. And the real issue is what makes extremist ideology or political culture a more fertile ground for the belief in a conspiracy or for conspiracy theories. I think that the most decisive factor is one of the very characteristic of political extremism. They are based on the conflict. They are based on a mannequin view of politics. They are based on the certainty of the existence of an enemy. That is precisely the certitude that, is that there is a, an enemy, an absolute evil up to anything, and all the more dangerous that it is often almighty, that makes the existence of a conspiracy theory or of a conspiracy believable. Well, to say it shortly, the more demonized the enemy, the more credible the threat of conspiracy. That is more or less what underlined by the French communist activist Jean Ricanati with regard to the Jewish doctor's plot of 1953, in which he did not believe at first, all the more than he was Jewish himself. And what he said was that if we have been surprised that such a conspiracy could have existed, it is because we tended to emphasize the weakness to underestimate the strength of the enemy. The ideology of the political culture embayed the political extremist in a kind of imagined wars and transformed political life into a virtual war with potentially hidden enemies. An illustration of this vision of politics is this neo-fascist and illegal Italian publication entitled Azione. I think you don't need my language skill in Italian to understand that it means action, uh, on which we can see two groups of demonstrators fighting. So in the background, you have um, a group composed of Atlanticists. Well, you have a dollar on the flag, and also a communist. So it's a bit strange to see all these people together, but still. And on the foreground, you have the young neo-fascists themselves. So in the comment below, here, it's a bit small in Italian also, the author explains that the only perspective is struggle. Struggle against enormous material forces that contest for the domination of the world, <coughs> against the single end that leads the degen degenerate humanity to destroy itself. So that's not a very optimistic view on the world and politics, but it's really, well, it's really based on conflict. That's very central, the core of uh, the political through of this small group of uh, neo-fascists. So this radical view on politics explains why the context was not interpreted the same way. A significant example, I didn't, well, 
speak that much about decolonization, but I will uh, in this case. A significant example is the development of an ultra-nationalist movement in France at the end of the 50s. The main part of the French opinion did not really care about the future of Algeria. You can, well, really find it in the polls. It's really obvious. They, are, they were really not involved. The only true concern about Algeria was that the conscripts were sent to Algeria, and they want to have them back, of course. But while the most part of the French population did not feel involved in the context of war, the radicalized nationalists shared the vision of a French empire under siege, threatened by the rest of the world, and in particular, undermined by the French left and the French far left, which were not political adversaries anymore, but which were traitors and enemy to the nation. Besides, a parallel could be drawn between the extremists and the army, well, not only because a large part of the army actually were nationalists of an already believing in a communist conspiracy, but it is inherently part of the job of the military, and especially the headquarters staff, to plan how to deal with the Soviet invasion and the communist fifth column. So they had also to immerse themselves into imagined war, such as extremists, but for different reasons. To, yeah, I will go to the conclusion, I think. So I skip uh, another explanation. The thing is that uh, the role played by ideology and political culture is not only an explanation restricted to radical movement. I don't have the time to go into details now, but you can also use it to uh, well explain the difference of the belief in conspiracy in France and in Italy. But I will just go directly to the conclusion. So, where did we go from there? What could this historical and empirical and also broken English study and presentation tell us about nowadays conspiracy theories? Of course, the contexts are very different. Now, we have, uh, well, we, we know what we call the decline of strong ideologies. The, lower, the level of mobilization, of political mobilization is really also lower. So the parties, the, mob the political movement are not the same, of course. The media also are very different, and uh, what well, with the increasing role of the internet, which is absolutely well, the core of uh, the actual conspiracy theories. So to be brief, uh, I will just point, I, I don't have really well, uh, the ambition to explain everything about nowadays conspiracy, of course, but I think I could point out five main conclusions of my work that could be fruitful. So first, contrary to what is often alleged in books on conspiracy theories, and even serious books, the good ones. Conspiracism is not necessarily stronger now. Uh, maybe it's true for the United States. The thing is that 99% of books on conspiracy theories are about the United States. But from what we, I know from France, for example, conspiracism was more important 50 years ago. And while nowadays the application of a political plot will, I think, distribute no one but the accuser. Second, there were often good reasons to believe in a conspiracy, and that's why, despite maybe well, the fact that we don't like them very much, and maybe also we despise the extremist movements or some extremist characters, we have to study them, and we have to study their belief in a comprehensive perspective, and to try to understand how they thought, and how they think still nowadays. Third, belief in conspiracy does not always mean the belief in a conspiracy theory. I think we should keep in mind that there is a large spectrum, a wide range of a wide range, sorry, of attitude of belief towards conspiracy. For the strength of this belief is clearly linked to political extremism. I'm saying that we say that I push, I push open doors because it has already been underlined by communists also in the past, so it's very, very obvious. But the consequence is that the study of conspiracy theories should not only consider that them as a result of kind of broad social context or the result of psychological phenomena, but also as very structured political beliefs that should be analyzed in the framework of well-identified and limited political groups. And fifth and last, according to the literature on the topic, the success of conspiracy theories would be the consequence of a situation of crisis and of postmodern uncertainty that lead individuals to find an answer to their question with conspiracy theories. Well, I think for that the situation of crisis, uh, well, there was a situation of crisis in the past and there were worse also. But the cases of post war France and Italy remind us that conspiracy theories 
are not or not only the result of postmodern uncertainty, but also the demonstration of very strong, ancient and long-lasting ideological certainties. And that is precisely why the most part of the conspiracy theories is so predictable. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Pascal. It's great to have the French and the Italian perspective. I think you're right, that sometimes we're a bit too focused on America, so it's a great to have that kind of that, that content. And also, thank you for the suggestions, which were very, which are very stimulating. So, but first, before we go to the discussion, David, you want to uh, uh, as you wish. Uh, stand me. <laughs> so, I was going to say, um, it's very interesting. When I read the full version of the paper. There's slightly touched on things that come out of the fuller version. Yeah, of the okay, so in the talk. So I was going to say three things. The first is just a final point of the conclusion seems to me to be completely right, which is that there is this view increasingly in the literature that conspiracy theory is a response to postmodern uncertainty. So you see the world, it makes no sense, there are no values, there's no structure, and you devise a conspiracy theory to make sense of it. And that seems to be a lot less plausible than this account, which is that you have a pre-existing set of deep political beliefs. And then when you look at the world through those eyes, it looks conspiratorial. And there are exceptions to this, but there's a broad analysis, and it seems to me that that's absolutely persuasive, which is why it's worth going to the pre-postmodern era to get a sense of what's really going on here. People have political beliefs that turn into conspiracy theorists. They don't become conspiracy theorists because they don't know what they think about the world. Maybe one or two people do, but the majority don't. So I completely think that's right, it's very valuable to have that laid out with historical underpinning. So I have two comments about the substance, one about the context and one about the question of what kinds of beliefs produce conspiracy theory. So the one about the context is the bit of the story that's not in the talk or the paper, but is, is, I think must be important here. And we're interested in conspiracy and democracy. So as you said, the Red Scare, maybe it's not as strong in Italy and France as it is in the United States in the 40s. But there's one scare in Italy and France that doesn't exist in the United States, which is that the Communist Party is actually going to win the general election. Particularly in 1948 in Italy, that fear, real fear, that there are two routes to communist power in these countries, because these are the strongest parties. Uh, coup is one, the ballot box is the other. That fear goes away after, I don't know, I'm not an expert at all on the history of this, so you, you can tell me that. As, a, as you trace the decline of this conspiracist mindset on the right or in the establishment fear of the communists taking over, it goes away in the late 40s, early 50s. But in 1948, I know in Italy, it was absolutely acute. And the 1948 Italian election is famous for the fact that it was being fought as a proxy war from Washington and the, the nascent CIA on the one side and from Moscow on the other side. The literature, I've read a bit of it, but the history of that election, people have uncovered all sorts of goings on behind the scenes to gear the outcome. The result, possibly of American money, possibly of an alliance between the United States and the Catholic Church, and all of everything else, is that the communists don't win the election. They, 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 these are, I don't know what I don't know what the polling results were, but um, they need significant votes, but they're not enough to for the communist party to take power. So you get an outcome where the communists potentially, if you take a fearful view, could have won an election but didn't, and the forces of centre-right conservatives do win the election. And in the short term, that should reinforce, and it probably did reinforce, the conspiracy view on both sides, because both results look fake from the other side's point of view. So the communists could have won the election but didn't. Well, they're not going to take defeat as the final piece of the story. Communism is about seizing power, so if you don't win it that way, you're going to win it another way. On the other hand, the right do win the election, but that's a fake victory, because that's not a real democratic victory. That's been provided for by American money, CIA money, interference, and so on. So it looks, those elections in that period look fake from both sides. You don't trust the losers to accept their defeat. You don't trust the winners to be serious about democracy. Over time, that's going to fade away, as it turns out that the communists do accept their defeat. And the winners kind of are serious about democracy in that 
elections continue, and in the long run, those parties eventually lose elections. But in the short term, I mean, I'm, I'm just speculating about this, but there's a possible version of the story that the electoral dynamic feeds into this conspiracy mindset. So maybe not from the point of view of the police, but that thought about the possibility of a communist ballot box victory feeds into this dynamic of suspicion. And this is, seems to be the difference between that and conspiracy theories now, is this is a function of conspiracy, conspiracy thinking in a very fragile democracy. So I feel no one really knows in the late 40s or the 50s if democracy is going to survive in the front of the field. As democracy survives, you get a different kind of set of conspiracy theories like you get in America today, which is the whole thing is a sham. But that, so I'm not sure how it fits into your story, but that late 40s, early 50s context might be particularly why not. So that was the first thought. And then the second thought was something that you touched on in the paper that you mentioned briefly here to do with the um, post-colonial story and the Algerian story, which is what is it about the mindset of extremists, that, that, you know, their, their political beliefs that inclines them to conspiracy theory. And one of the words that you mentioned in the paper is betrayal, that on the far right in France, this sense that they thought that there was a wide set of people who shared that belief. It turns out almost no one shared that belief, but they were a very small minority. And the people that they thought shared that belief, and this is particularly on the central right, not on the central left, so people who end up in government that they believed were on their side turn out not to be on their side. Um, and I just wondered, reading your paper, whether that is actually a very important part of understanding this mindset, because betrayal is one of the distinctive characteristics of political extremism. It turns out most people don't share your beliefs. Now, if you thought they did share your beliefs, it turns out they don't. You have two possible ways to interpret that. One is that they change their mind, which is very uncomfortable, because that's like, you have these beliefs, and people who have those beliefs are capable of rationally thinking those are the wrong beliefs. Or they've been co-opted by darker forces that, as it were, infiltrated them and that whole belief set. So they get into government, it's not that they've thought about it and thought, actually, this fight is no longer worth fighting. They get into government, and in government, dark forces that surround government have co-opted them. And it seems to me that it is possible on your analysis, which is that political extremism has a particular connection to conspiracy theory. That's one of the reasons why. The political <coughs> extremists, more than people somewhere in the middle, are more likely to think that what's going on is a form of betrayal. And if, you, if it is betrayal, then you have to know why, why you need to be betrayed by and why. And so in, your, in the paper version, one of the longer lasting conspiracies is precisely that one, right? The way you began it. The view on the French far right that what happens in Algeria and the creation of the Fifth Republic is a giant conspiracy. And it's a giant conspiracy not so much because of the behavior of the left, but because of the behavior of the central right. That are somehow another on your thing become part of the whole. So that's one, what, which you touch on in the paper, but you don't sort of develop in any detail, but that's one possible feature of this kind of mindset. And it probably um, cuts both ways, from left or from right, which is if you think that your worldview is one that should be shared by a lot of people, and it turns out that it's not, you focus on the people that you were convinced were closest to you, and you assume that they have somehow been co-opted by the dark. And that, I think, might be part of the story that runs right the way through to the present in terms of conspiracy theories, which again are on the fringes on the whole. But one of the dynamics of that way of thinking about conspiracy theory is this obsession, not with the people on the other side of the divide, but the people who you thought were close to you, mm -hmm. you were on the far, you were in the Tea Party and the Republican Party. All of the conspiracists raised, it's not directed at the Democrats, really, it's directed at those, and the, the real anger is directed at those centrist Republicans who have somehow been co-opted into the and so that's the dynamic of the trail. So I think, and it was reading your paper that made me think of this, it's not something we talked about much, but that the trail might be a really important thing to think about conspiracy. Okay, so those are the two the first point is just I agree with you, but those two questions be interested in something about elections and something about the trail. So I'm gonna sit down. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh, we could yeah. Do you, yes. to, do you want to just briefly say something to those two? Yeah, I can say something. Oh, about three will be very quick. I mean, very fast. I've already uh, well, I edited a book about that. About the trial? Yeah, about the trial. I mean, about 
I worked on betrayal, political betrayal, political violence, and uh, controversy. Sorry. I should have done that. You're right. I mean, you're too modest. You should have said that. I mean, the point is that, of course, the kind of well definition characteristic after characteristic of political extremism I'm trying to do, actually. Um, I will, uh, the, your, uh, what you said about uh, the election is very well, uh, uh, it's a very good point. Uh, the thing is that I did not have that much time to, to go into detail. Uh, the thing is that uh, I will just speak about Italy because uh, in France it was very clear after 1946 that well, the Socialist Party was very reluctant to uh, well, build a kind of alliance with uh, the Communist Party. They know them very well from the 30s and 20s, and well, they bad habit to fight all together. Yeah, I was, I was really thinking of the 48 election, yeah, which is the that famous was, paranoid election where that was, was, that that was kind of distrust, I mean. Yeah. But uh, you're right, in 1948, there was this election in April 1948 in Italy, and there was a big fear, really a huge fear within the well, center, center right, uh, that the communists could win with that Aviv and the part of the Socialist Party could win the election. The thing is that the polls uh, were without any kind of ambiguity. It was clear that the center right would win the election. From the beginning, from the very beginning. But the point is that uh, the character of who uh, created the first institute of study of polls was also from the center right. He was absolutely terrified by the eventuality of uh, the victory of the communists, by the way. It was, it was very funny because the Poles he managed to, uh, to build were, well, predicting the victory of the centre-right, but still, he was very, very frightened of the possible victory of the Communist Party. But the thing is that the communist leaders just claimed that these Poles were just fake. It was a political manipulation. And of course, when the results, after months and months of propaganda, when the results appeared to give a large victory to the center right, the communists had the impression that, of course, it was a, well, someone shitty. It's really, there was a problem about that. It was impossible because the communist leader said the contrary during months. And the polls were supposed to be fake. So, of course, it's also one explanation of the riots in July that they have the impression that they have been robbed that the victory should have been theirs. And there's a kind of, well, revenge about, uh, about the election at that moment. They just want to, add, well, use the another well, way to seize power, which is violence. And of course, there's a clear connection, but it's quite complicated because, uh, of course, the polls existed and they were very clear. The result was very predictable really, from the very beginning, but of course, it was uh, the Paul Institute was supposed to be, and it was from the center right.